Hello, everyone. Um, I'll be presenting Holoviews. And it's a library we've been working on for quite a while now. And first of all, I wanted to say Holoviews is not actually a plotting library. So um, our actual slogan or motto is stop plotting your data, let it visualize itself. And that's a pretty controversial statement taken as face value. And, but I'll show you what that actually means. So when working in a terminal or, for example, in the Jupyter Notebook, you'll be used to. You just add two numbers, you execute the cell, and you immediately get back a string representation which tells you pretty much everything about this data. Oh, yes. OK, that's better. OK, so but if, when loading, for example, in some more complex data, such as a NumPy array from disk, and we now display it, well, actually, this representation doesn't tell us much. We cannot actually interpret it. Uh, it's actually mis there's missing values and so on. Um, for that reason, Holoviews provides a number of elements which allow you to wrap your data. And actually, you can always access the data via the dot data attribute. So here you can see the same numpy, numpy array is accessible here. However, if we actually display this object itself, and it, it immediately visualizes itself. So what we, now we can actually see, we can make sense of this data. It's the Mandelbrot road set. Okay. Um, however, if you, you'll notice that actually the axes aren't labeled correctly. And what we actually want to do is we want to associate some metadata with this data to, to keep them together to, to provide a semantically meaningful unit. And for that, we can provide, you can specify what we call key dimensions, which is just the dimensions of this uh, numpy array. And by specifying these, we, Holoviews actually associates these with the appropriate axes. Okay, and Holoviews actually provides a wide library of these types of what we call elements. And here is actually, we've, uh, so here, for example, we have some histograms, curves, scatter points, polygons, everything you're familiar with. Um, and actually, we've loaded this object from disk. So it's an actual, actual Holoviews object, and you can actually access each of these elements. So you can go in and get this histogram, or even the value of this particular bar back out, or the, the position of this point. Okay? So, as I said, this is actually a Holoviews object, and uh, it's a actually a layout, and this is something called, this is something we call a composition. So a composition is very useful because it allows you to stick different types of data together, and we make this very easy via two operators we use. So using the plus operator, you can put s several plots by side by side, uh, laying them out or on top of each other or whatever, and using the mul operator, you can actually overlay separate plots together very, very easily. So I'll just quickly demonstrate this. So again, we have our, we now have our um, Mandelbrot set again, and I'll execute the cell and go through it. Okay, so the object again is just the Mandelbrot set from before. However, here we've, um, using the plus operator, we've put, to put together a cross section uh, of this object uh, using the sample method, which actually we've, we've, sam we've basically taken a cross section along the imaginary axis at point zero. And this has given us this curve ob object, which we can then uh, put together into this layout. <coughs> and secondly, we have this mull operator, with which we've overlaid an, uh, a horizontal line on top of this plot, um, which basically shows, yeah, which highlights the position where we've taken the cross-section. So very, within a line of code, we've generated a pretty complex plot. Okay, so that's one type of composition that's very important. And Holoviews also provides um, container types to allow you to do high dimensional uh, exploration of your data. So this allows you to lay out your data spatially or over time or reveal it by a live interaction, which is often something you want to do. So again, I'll go back to this notebook and actually, okay, so here we again generate an image and this is actually a function of sine and, and cosine and we can parameterize this into a function very easily and here is parameterized by the frequency and amplitude. And using this the dictionary expression and this container type that we call a hollow map, we can actually explore this parameter space. So for example, here we're varying both the frequency and amplitude. They become the keys of this hollow map, and the values are the el image elements that we had saw before with the evaluated function, with the array using the evaluated function in it. So if I execute this, it I didn't execute the actual function. Okay, so here we immediately get back a nice little widget which allows us to explore this parameter space. So you can see the effect of frequency and amplitude, getting brighter and so on. But yes, as I said, we provide several of these container types, which actually allow you to, first of all, the hollow map allows you to animate it and so on, while a grid allows you to actually view it spatially. So we'll say we want the grid 
the, the amplitude to be laid out in a grid spatially. So if we do that, we actually get the same thing. Again, we can vary both frequency and amplitude. But here we've laid out, laid out the, the amplitude across this grid. And additionally, we've also, using the plus operator, again, even these complex container types can be joined and put together in these, into complex uh, layouts. Okay? And actually, these different container types, so there's four of them, I won't go through them all, they're all um, interchangeable. So you can actually cast this hollow map from above, you can cast it to a grid space, and now we can actually see this full parameter space, the, both the amplitude and frequency dimension. Okay, so, so far we've been entirely focused on specifying the data itself and the metadata with it, which to form tight semantic units. However, we actually want to customize these plots often, and that's what I'll hand you over to. Okay, so um, what you've seen just now is that Holoviews really lets you capture the semantics of your data. So we looked at some NumPy arrays and the metadata associated with it. But of course, if you actually work with your data, uh, we often let you, uh, we try and give you as good defaults as we can so you don't have to worry about customizing the visual aspect. But this can only last so long. At some point, you're going to have to want to uh, publish your data and you want to actually customize the exact look of your plots. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go through what Philip's just shown you and, and give you a good example of how you can actually customize the, the look of your plot. And Holoviews lets you customize things in a lot of different ways. So I'm going to start with the first way. So uh, we support an IPython-specific syntax called the magic system. So uh, this is specific to IPython, and we have something called the ops magic. Now, uh, everything you see with Holoviews can be done with pure Python if you want, but it is actually very convenient to work with a notebook. So we have all our different elements. And you can have tab completion here. So here we want to customize an image. So we just tab complete an image. And what we want to do, for example, is say we don't like the color map. We don't like hot. We want to use some different color map for whatever reason. Uh, what we can do is we can tab complete again and choose a different color map. So let's just say I pick blues. So if I run this, <coughs> I now see the same thing again, but with the color map I chose. Uh, in this particular case, because I use the cell magic, and you see this because there's two percentage signs here, uh, just this object's been customized. This now has, this object's now associated with this particular color map I've chosen. And it's only for this particular object. So if I want to actually, say, change things a bit more globally, I might want to actually set something for all the color maps in the rest of this notebook. I can do the same thing again using this, the line magic. So there's a single percentage sign. Again, there's all this tab completion, and you have all these different options you can select from uh, quite easily. And again, let's just say this time I want to use the uh, greens color map. So here we go. Uh, now run this again, and the hollow map is now using greens. So uh, this is one of the sort of things you might want to customize, but there's other things. Uh, for example, here we have these nice sliders, and they're great for you know, uh, quick interactive exploration and maybe for making a website and so on. But if you, uh, if you want to actually publish, you want to output to something else. You might want to output to a vector format, P, uh, for example, SVG or PDF or something like this, and you want to change the output format. So what you can do is you can uh, uh, use the output magic, which is a different magic, again, I'll use the cell magic, and this time I'll, I'll change the output to be, say, a GIF. So while that runs, what you're seeing is that all those dimensions that Philip mentioned, the amplitude and the frequency, are just laid out across time and then just played back at you. So that's just a bit fast, but uh, you can easily slow it down, you can control the frame rate and so on. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, so uh, we can do that here, and again you see that run. Now, uh, there's a final thing which is really quite important. Because Holoviews is not a plotting library, and we can use any kind of plotting backend, like a third-party library, uh, we, we've been using matplotlib here, but we can actually use bokeh. So uh, if you heard Brian's talk yesterday about bokeh, we can switch to that backend instead. Now, bokeh is great for sort of uh, working with a notebook interactively, and I'll show you that now. So this time, I will switch uh, the backend to bokeh. Uh, let's just try that. Oops. Quotes. Okay, so if I run this, ah, I use tab completion. So this is why tab completion is useful. I'll go back and just show you the different backends. We have uh, Bokeh map backend, we have matplotlib, we actually have MPLD3, and even NBAG. So there's quite a few options. Now let's just run that, and let's see what happens. Uh, what we have is a Bokeh version of the same plot we saw earlier. You can now do all the interactive things that Bokeh allows you to do, uh, panning, zooming, resetting your plots, all the navigation tools, and so on. Okay, so what I'm trying to get to here 
uh, holoviews are so customizable that even if you have something quite complex, you can build it. You can build it with these operators of plus and mol, um, and you can customize it to be the way you want. And for very specialized plots, you can also extend holoviews, and I'll show you that shortly. So uh, here are a couple of examples. Uh, this is uh, an example from a machine learning challenge which shows you some uh, EEG data. So these points correspond to positions on the skull. And you can see they've been laid out uh, appropriately. Now, everything you see here is a Holoviews object, just uh, declared as, as, uh, uh, from the standard library. We just import them uh, from, from, from Holoviews library, we import them. We can then use it to uh, set the colors, the size of the points. We can add these text elements and, uh, and so on. So because we've got a Holo map here, we can also explore it. We can move these sliders around. Uh, and this is, again, uh, no plotting code required, just declarations of how you want it to look and what the data actually contains. So you can see these values changing over time, and on the, on the side you have this histogram which shows you the distribution of all the values at any particular time. Okay, so here's a new uh, next example. Uh, this is actually showing you how you can actually wrap some uh, plots from a different some external code. So later you'll be hearing about the quant library. Uh, in uh, f um, quantum physics you have the Bloch sphere, and what we, what's happened is a very simple wrapper around the plotting code that they provide, that uh, is just using matplotlib, allows you to compose uh, uh, these types of plots on C with, uh, with all the other things in Holoview. So again, we're using uh, a layout, and we can use a, a, a um, holo map. So here we have it uh, play backwards and forwards uh, uh, over time. The other thing I should mention is that A and B are, again, completely standard Holoview's elements, uh, and no special coding was required. OK, so I'll show you an actual quick live example. Uh, let's go down. Yeah. OK. So here what we have um, is an example that's going to use Bokeh again, but this time instead of just loading these pickle objects, which are Holly's objects you've been looking at, we'll start from a CSV file. So we have uh, an eco some economic data across states, and uh, what we do is uh, we're going to filter out some fields and we're going to create a hollow map. Now because we told it to use the Bokeh backend, you can actually zoom uh, and actually explore all these different um, pieces of data separately, uh, and we're also using this thing called live. What live means is that we're actually transferring the data needed to display this uh, as you move the sliders. Because uh, this is not actually a part of Bokeh, the slider here. It's offered by Holoviews. And what it does, it lets you do uh, the same sort of thing of laying things out over time and so on that you've just seen. Um, right, so as you can see, this actually is a nice way of exploring data with just a couple lines of code. However, this is not actually the most powerful way of using Holoviews, which is to uh, actually integrate it with your code base. So if you have a library and it, and it just simply declares these objects, there's no external plotting code required, you just declare what your data is in your metadata and you return it, then someone can just work with your data in the notebook. They can compose things together, pull things apart, and because the data is actually there, they can dr drill straight down into it. So how does this relate to reproducibility? Because we actually have our data, we can start doing comparisons. And this is important. So if I have a notebook from a year ago, I can actually see if the actual data is the same as what I have today. I can go through the notebook and compare uh, these Holoview objects at every single level. So we have notebook testing, for example. Um, we actually have archival facilities to, uh, for example, save out uh, um, any sort of format, SVG, PDF, as, as you go along, uh, in the background. So just as you run your notebook, it's, it's saving things out. Uh, and we, because we can start with widgets and this, these nice defaults, you can start by interacting with your data. You don't need to worry about how it looks. And as your research develops, you can think about your visualization. You can start customizing how it looks. Uh, customizing how you use your data, whether you want to use Bokeh or not, for example, or matplotlib. And then towards the end, you can export to a uh, vector format for publication. So it actually supports your whole workflow. So uh, what's in conclusion, what does it really do? It kind of makes the notebook more powerful as a format. It kind of fulfills the promise of notebook. Uh, it's more readable. Uh, you need less code to do things. Uh, and you don't have notebooks full of code anymore. And this actually helps the readability and the reproducibility of your work. Again, as I said, we uh, do c keep the metadata and the data together, which makes these semantically meaningful units that you can save to disk or pickle or save to database and so on. And the key point is that complex visualizations become easy. Our data can now just visualize itself, and uh, it actually does support your whole workflow from when you first start exploring all the way through to uh, coming to publication. So uh, please do visit our website at holoviews.org. Um, uh, there's a kind of grab bag list of different features here. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, yeah, I guess any questions.
thank you for the presentation. Could the next speaker please come down and prepare the laptop? We have time for one quick question. Uh, we're actually working on this right now. So the question was whether we're going to have facilities for better loading of large data sets. Uh, and this is something we're very much focused on. Uh, we're going to look at, for example, HDF5 support and dynamically loading your data uh, as you display it. So you don't need to have huge notebooks and have everything in memory at the same time. Uh, and that's actually something we're actively working on right now. Uh, we've got a branch for that, but it's not quite ready to merge. But we will be having that very soon. OK. Quick question. Quick thing, um, will you be publishing the notebook you're using for demonstrations there? Because it looks like a very good overview of what you can do. Uh, we have a lot of examples on the website. Uh, so the question was about whether we have this notebook available. Yes, uh, we can easily make it available on the website. But we already have lots of d documentation and lots of good examples already. So you, you might want to look at that. OK, thank you. OK. OK, thanks a lot.